Um, those of you who are um, of my generation uh, will remember that the uh, 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 original work on the relationship between inequality and economic development owes an enormous amount uh, to Simon Kuznets, um, who basically offered a stylized interpretation of um, the path of economic uh, development, uh, according to which uh, the dominant forces in affecting uh, inequality in the society over the course of time uh, was intersectional transitions, and particularly between agricultural uh, an agricultural agrarian economy and industry, uh, with the idea being that in the U.S. in the 19th century, or Britain in the 19th century, or China today, uh, the dominant movement in inequality is uh, rising incomes driving, mainly occurring in the urban areas as a result of industrialization, and driving a uh, wedge between the cities and the countryside. But that as countries move over, in some sense, toward being primarily uh, urban, primarily industrial, uh, other forces come to dominate, mainly because the agricultural sector is no longer uh, so large a part of the population. Uh, and because uh, that saw that uh, uh, the normal course of events would be one in which you would have declining inequality uh, as uh, uh, industrialization deepened, trade unions arose, and, and in general, as the gap between the city and the countryside became less significant because there was less countryside, relatively speaking. Uh, that is, remains a, a core proposition for us, and one for which we think there is a substantially stronger body of evidence than most economists who worked on this in recent years uh, have uh, been uh, willing to uh, own, own up to. But we do think that Kuznets would, faced with a globalized economy, have um, been willing to consider, I and mean, certainly in line with the basic frame of his analysis, a world in which um, <clears throat> at least certain countries at the high end of the income scale are, have a different relationship between the path of uh, economic growth and, and, and economic inequality. And the US is an example of this, providing <coughs> advanced uh, exports to the world economy, machine tools, transportation goods, financial services. Uh, you find that the income in the U.S. rises most rapidly in global investment booms, uh, and in low circumstances, it's the high incomes, not the low incomes of the working population, which are gaining most rapidly in relative terms. And in fact, the, the Kuznets curve would tend to rise uh, on that account alone. So that provides this sort of stylized representation of the relationship, provides a kind of underpinning of the basic framework that we think is reasonable uh, for thinking about this problem at the global scale. But it's also possible uh, to imagine that this curve is not stable uh, and that events which happen at the global scale are affecting all or most of the countries uh, in, uh, on, on a common basis. And if one observes that, then one has also to take into account the effect of forces which Kuznets would probably die. Um, really not concerned with it didn't seem to him to be a uh, serious uh, proposition uh, that are affecting most of the countries of the world in a common way. Um, our method, the kind of data generating device, uh, is a very simple one. Uh, it's uh, a long said you can teach it to any graduate student in 20 minutes, except the Russian. Russian only takes 10 minutes. Um, the, uh, it involves uh, using a decomposition that was developed by um, uh, Hans Heil, the econometrician of the um, mid 20th century, based in Chicago. Um, and it has the nice virtue that in order to uh, come up <coughs> with an estimate, your information requirements are extremely small. The Tile statistic basically is a generalized entropy statistic. It has a component of within uh, groups, which is based upon the um, average income of each individual relative to the group average, uh, divided by the number of group of individuals in the group. But for our purposes, we're only interested in a very um, simple piece of the overall statistic, which we'll call the between groups component of Tile's T statistic, for which one only needs 
data that are in fact presented, usually in tabular form, uh, for group entities, which might be, for example, industries, or it might be geographic entities like provinces or counties or whatever it might be, and what only needs uh, a piece of information telling you how big each group is in relation to the overall um, uh, economy that you're looking at, which is a population weight, and the average income of that group relative to the average income of the, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, population as a whole, which is this R sub J, number. so P sub J, R sub J, is information which is readily available from published administrative data for a very wide range of, of entities, and from any of them, one can, uh, with a graduate student and a fair amount of coffee, uh, compute overnight uh, tables of inequality statistics. And the question that then emerges is, how effective uh, is this very inexpensive source of data in providing a picture of what's going on in the world, uh, in the overlying economy? Uh, and we did a great deal of work to, in some sense, validate or to investigate the, both the circumstances under which our measures were actually corresponding to others that were available, uh, but also the limits uh, to the uh, reliability of this particular approach. Uh, and the answer to the question, broadly speaking, is that we found it to be really very reliable way to multiply uh, observations uh, in, a, in a world economy where inequality measures are particularly those taken in the more traditional way by survey instruments are intrinsically very noisy, often not uh, homogeneous, not, not comparable from one to another, uh, and often separated by long periods when you don't have any information at all. So I'll give you an idea of the extent to which one can uh, get information this way. This is a, a table showing the, uh, uh, the distribution of country year observations that one is able to get from a single data source, namely the industrial statistics of the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, mm -hmm. uh, going back to the 1960s and covering all the regions of the world. If one took the original World Bank data source on inequality uh, that was published by Diener German Squire in the middle 1990s and very heavily used in the literature, and I have no uh, criticism to make of the effort they made, which was gargantuan. Uh, but they were able to come up with a, something between seven and 800 observations that they considered to be of acceptable quality, which is a country year observations. And the effect of that was to uh, uh, leave very large gaps in the record, historical record for lots of developing countries, for Africa in particular, uh, and uh, also a lot of inconsistencies. I don't think I've got here um, uh, a, I need to put up the slides which show you some of the problems that are um, evident from the uh, World Bank's data sets of that particular time. Uh, they've since added a great many numbers, but I don't think they're able, I don't think it's possible with that approach to resolve the inconsistencies and reduce the noise of the data set. This is uh, just a snapshot of, uh, I don't know, 30 or so countries taken from our data set uh, to give you a sense of the uh, of, of, of the distribution of the measures from low to high and also of the uh, change that happens over time in our measures. And, and you can see, I think, that it's a uh, uh, it, it, they're, they're, the nice feature of this particular approach is that it has very few surprises. Uh, countries that you would expect to be high in inequality, Brazil, for example, or India, show up that has high inequality, Argentina. Uh, countries that you expect it to be um, uh, have experienced a lot of instability, show up as having a large degree of um, uh, variation over time in their inequality measures, and countries which, uh, like the standard of countries, of course, which we know to be social democratic and stable, uh, show up as having both low measures and, and very stable measures. So that's something which I think at least is a, a very uh, compact way of illustrating the point that uh, this is a, uh, a, measure, a, a series of measures which uh, have a lot of prima facie um, plausibility to it. And I could go on on that subject for as much time as you want it to take, um, but that's just a simple way of summarizing it. 